Hello and welcome back to Boring Dad Gaming, where today we're going to be playing some more Death Trick Double Blind. Now, we've only got a few people to speak to here, but it is only one hour until the big show, so... Um, I don't honestly know how we're going to get this done. Um, I can't get the last alibi because Alice still hasn't appeared. I can't go looking for her because it won't let me in the backstage area. Um... Finding my attack is going to be difficult. I think everyone here I've spoken to about it, so... Yeah, I think... Yeah, I don't know. We'll talk, to, we'll talk to everyone. I don't really know what line of inquiry I'm going to be taking, though, to be quite honest. I'm kind of waiting for the big show and, you know, events to happen that may, uh, you know, shed new light on things. The fair is incredibly busy this time of the day. Long lines are forming in front of the food vendors. Seems like everyone's grabbing a bite before the big show. Now this is where, I haven't noticed this before, <laughs> um, but this post, you can see the teeth marks from the horse. This is the calliope they're talking about. I thought a calliope was like um, like a merry-go-round type thing with uh, all, the all the wooden horses and animals and stuff, but it's apparently this, because um, this, this is the wooden post that the horse attacked. Um, I was wondering when they were mentioning that whether, you know, like a... Maybe this had broken in some way and it had been an act. Maybe this had stabbed through Hattie and it had been an accident. I don't know who then covered it up by tying her up and stuff. But I wondered if, if that horse breakout incident might have something to do with the murder. But um, it, do, it doesn't look like it. it it's, been, it's been damaged, but it hasn't like been torn loose or anything, has it? So, so much for that. Right in the middle of all the crowd and commotion, I spot Chip. It's pretty easy because of his outfit and his hat. He looks like he's standing in line for the corn dogs and entertaining everyone around him while he waits. Feeling my eyes on him, he turns around and smiles. Oh, hi. Come here. Sorry, everyone. This is my friend, Mr. Jones. I promise he's not cutting in line. We just have some business to discuss. So you gotta excuse me. Oh, wait, it's my turn. Two corn dogs and a large fry, please, and thank you. After the crowd reluctantly disperses and Chip grabs his treats, he comes over to me and hands me a corn dog. Here? Oh, I, uh... Come on, I can tell you're hungry just by that look on your face. He can see me hesitate, so he shakes the stick in his hand and pushes it in front of my face. Come on, take one. We'll eat and talk. I accept. Chip takes a big bite out of his, uses his free hand to open the bag of fries and shares them with me. Mmm, yummy, yummy. Is this your dinner? Mm-hmm. Don't you, uh... Don't people who work here have catering? Of course we do. I'm just skipping it in favor of the lovely corn dogs. I'm a clan of the people. Besides, this way I won't have to go back to my train. Why don't you want to go back to your train car? Just don't want to see my roommate smug face today. You've met Echo right. You know we live together. But how do you know your roommate will be there? I don't know. Maybe he's thinking the same thing and he's out dodging me. You don't like each other, but it seems like you have a lot in common. What? Take that back. We're nothing alike. The only thing we have in common is how much we don't like each other. That was just... What did San Su say? Know thy enemy? He could be dodging me too, but I'm not going to risk it. Besides, this way I get to have two corn dogs. One of mankind's greatest inventions. He swallows the last of the corn dog and turns his focus to the fries. Do you want any more of those? Oh no, I'm good. You can have them. Wait, you've read Sun Tzu? Alright, watch this. He opens his mouth wide and pours the rest of the bag down his mouth, demolishing them in a second. Some of the spectators, I didn't realize there were people still watching, applaud. Chip gulps down the fries and bows to them in acknowledgement. And then he leans into me to whisper. Anyway, what about you? How are you, Dan? What about me? We're departing Tology tonight in just a few hours. You aren't following us to another city, are you? No, of course not. Then your clock is ticking. Tick tock, tick tock, your reputation as a detective is under threat if you don't manage to solve this case. To be honest, my bigger motivator is the check. Ooh, that too. Anyway, if there's anything I can help with, just let me know. I do have a few questions. I'm not sure about what, but... So, someone was saying we should quote, ask everyone about the crime scene photo, so let's, let's have another, another go at that. Here we go. Moses specifically asked me not... Not to show this to people in the circus. Okay, I, th I think Chip wasn't one of the people on the scene, was he? So that probably, probably why. We've done it with some and not others. Um, v also the autopsy report. I mean, we'll try. Yeah. 
So it's getting things ticked off on this list, if nothing else, right? Um, I mean, one thing I don't feel like I've been able to follow up on is the uh, the thing with the Smash Trophy, right? They, the people are saying that it likely happened since Monday, because I did, uh, I forget who ex the exact chain of events, but I think Yan said it wasn't broken when she went in there, and then it was when we went in there, so... Some, someone's been in there in the intervening time, but who do I kind of speak to? How do I speak to someone about that? I don't really know. Which probably means it's not important. Should we tell about the secret romance? So you knew about Aideen and Rolf's relationship? Sure, if that's what you want to call it. I know Red is trying to be super sneaky about it, and I don't think she knows that I know, but come on. Red might be good at keeping a secret, but Jay couldn't pay the big guy to keep it off his face. So does everyone else know about it? No, I think it's pretty obvious if you know what to look for, but not everyone is perceptive as yours truly. Boss man surely never pays attention to this sort of thing, though I think that's mostly intentional. A little birdie would probably flip out if she knew, and since nothing has caught fire or been filled with spiders recently, I assume she doesn't know yet. And I doubt Pinocchio even understands the concept of the birds and the bees. He has a nickname for everyone, huh? So yeah, no one else knows but me, and now you too. Which gives me a perfect opportunity. What? Now, if the secret gets out, she's gonna think you did it. Why, are you really going to? What are you, who are you gonna tell? Hmm, if an opportunity comes up. Now, now, wouldn't it be fun? Wouldn't it be fun if I told you, would it? He winks at me. Sneaky clown, all right, well, we asked at least. Who should we ask? We could ask him about someone. There isn't a huge amount of people here to talk to, so... Um... We haven't seemed to have asked him about Hattie, why don't we? I guess we ask him about that. You're familiar with Hattie, weren't you? Um... He shrugs and indicates so-so with his hand. Do you have any theories about what happened? Anyone that might have something against her? I can't think of anything. Really, nothing. It's not me, though. I can tell you that much. Great, very helpful. I'm sure you're the only one who will say that. Sorry, I just, I truly don't have any idea what happened. I don't want to get anyone into trouble. Well, to be honest, it's more like I don't want to get into trouble myself. For getting people who are not supposed to be in trouble. In trouble. Oh, that word salad somehow makes sense to me. I nod and decide to switch tactics. What about Hattie? What kind of person was she? Well, she was a phenomenal magician. That's all? I'd have thought that's a given. Hey, not every magician is actually good at magic, okay? What even is a magician without magic? Ian? What? You asked what's a magician without magic? Magician? So minus the magic, so Ian? His voice gets progressively weaker under my glare as he finishes his sentence. Uh, I thought I had something there. You know what, never mind, let's move on. Actually, I'm going to ask him about himself, because another thing that hasn't come up at all is the fact that I'm pretty sure he's that senator's son. Um, have we talked to him about the financial situation, the circus? Although I think it's um, Jackie that actually has that line of questioning, isn't it? Well, let's ask him about himself, see what he says. Can you tell me a little bit more about yourself? Sure, name's Chep, as you know. I'm the clan here, and I'm on temporary ringmaster duty with Hattie. You know. I've been with the circus for six years. Let's see, what else? I like hats and cheeseburgers, traveling and drinking games, opera and puns. I haven't even gotten around to asking him a question yet, but he carries on counting facts on his fingers. What I, do, what, what I don't like? Celery and cherry-flavored ice cream. I think they taste weird. Daylight saving time. I can work whenever I want. Pretentious people. That goes without saying. Um, how did you become a clown? Do you have? Did you have to train for this? He crosses his arms. Sir, this is a serious profession. We have clown schools and everything. Is everyone the class clown at clown school? Do you have school exams? What do you even do for those exams? Yes, yes, and I'm not sure. I never went to one. I'm 100% raw talent. Put a baby duckling in ward and it'll swim. Put me in front of a crowd and I'll make them laugh. I bet the school clowns are jealous. Oh, yeah, you have no idea. Now you know everything there is to know about me. Just from that? That's important. All right, fair dues. Not terribly revealing. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to leave him for now. 
Those two just sling accusations at each other, don't they? Uh, I don't. I, mean, I don't know if I've examined this scene, but equally, I don't know if there's a tremendous amount to discover here. So I'm going to move on. Um, we're going to go to train car number one. When I walk in, Aideen and Yana are sitting by the table near the window having dinner. Oh, hi, Mr. Jones. Hey. Come in, sit down, please. We're just having dinner. Aideen drags a chair over from the vanity desk for me to sit. They're close to finishing their meal, and judging by what's left on the plates, they were having meatloaf and grilled cheese sandwiches. Aideen notices me eyeing the sandwich. Have you eaten yet? Do you want some tea? I've got some leftover uh, toast, and we have a tiny stove over there. I can fix you a grilled cheese sandwich. Well, if it's not too much trouble, that would be lovely. She finishes hers in one bite and walks over to the small stove to prepare my modest meal. So, how's the investigation going? Caught any lies? You mean besides the one you orchestrated? Hey, I didn't... well... She laughs in acknowledgement, but doesn't seem repentant. You mean about when, where she was on Monday night? Yes, as you eventually admitted. You were here alone. She wasn't actually with you. She was... Ahem. Why the ambiguity? Right, what I don't understand is, why did you lie about it? You had a solid alibi regardless, and a corroborating witness in Rolf. I know you wanted to keep the thing between you. I don't get to continue because Aideen's giving me a desperate look. I instinctively look back at Yan, who has stood up from her chair. What does co co corrob corroborate, corroborate whatever mean? She was with Rolf. Hey, Yan. Yan ignores her and rushes in front of me, craning upwards towards my face. Was she? Um... She was? I mean... Aideen sighs and walks over. Don't be hard on the detective. Yes, I was. Yan, I didn't tell you. They both look deathly serious. I'm serious too. Seriously confused. What does this have to do with anything? Why didn't Aideen tell Yan what she was actually doing if they were making up the lie together? In fact, why didn't she tell Yan where she was on Monday night? Why would Yan be upset to know she was with Rolf? And why is she getting upset now? The room is quiet for a few moments, but I can see something brewing on Yan's face. It's like she herself didn't even know how to react. After a moment, she starts screaming. Ah! Ah! She lifts her hands like she wants to hit something or someone, but she doesn't. Instead, she stumps out of the room. Wait! Yan slams the train door behind her. Aideen's left in place, speechless. She sighs. Uh, wait, what was that? Aideen looks worried, guilty, and perplexed. I don't know. You don't know? Do you have a kid, Mr. Jones? I do not. Ah, then you won't know what I'm talking about. But Yan is not. For all intents and purposes, she's my kid. Now and forever. Why doesn't she like you with Rolf? To be honest, I'm not entirely sure. My guess is kids with abandonment issues can get, uh, possessive. That's why I didn't tell her about... Well, there's no use talking about that now. I'm sorry, I said something I wasn't supposed to, didn't I? I didn't know that she didn't know. It's, uh, it's fine. Are you going to go after her? I think, I think she needs some time. Can you please go check on her to make sure she's okay? Me? Yeah, you. You were here. You started it, didn't you? Well, if she's still saying I started it, clearly she's not fine. All right. Do you know where she might be? The train starts shaking. Earthquake? Aideen stifles a laugh before pointing upwards. You mean... Go check on her, please. I'll join you in a bit. I head outside the train and look at the roof. A foot in a red ballet flat dangles over the edge. The question is, how do I get up there? Oh, I'm getting up too old for this. After I finally climb onto the train roof with some significant maneuvering, Yan's already looking a little less angry. Probably due to my unintentional physical comedy act. Okay, theory. Broken trophy. Yan running around on the roof. That's what I think broke it, because she, she does that, it, you know, it shakes things around, could easily have knocked over a glass trophy, I mean, would it have smashed that badly, just knocked over, perhaps? I don't know, that's, that's my working theory on that one for now. She looks like she's about to cry. She sees me come up and turns her back. Hi. Why are you here? Well, you're... she thought you needed some time. So she sent you? How are you gonna help? To be honest, I don't know. The only thing I know how to do is ask questions. I don't like questions. Well, sorry, but uh, do you mind if I ask what made you upset? Was it because Aideen was with Rolf? Or was it because she didn't tell you? 
She whips around with red-rimmed eyes, angrier than before. No, you don't get it. You don't get anything. She stomps on the ground, a.k.a. the ceiling of Aideen's room, and yells, Why are you here? I don't even know you. If she wants to know why, she's... She... She... Stomps. Can ask me. Stomp. Herself. Oops, I screwed that one up. She really doesn't like questions. Her voice gets quieter and she whispers. It's not about any of that. Please don't cry, Yan. Just as I start to panic, Aideen's head finally pops into view and she sits down next to Yan. I'm sorry. I'm not sure if I should show myself out, but Aideen doesn't seem to want me to leave. Or maybe I actually want to stay. You were with him. Yeah? Is that, is that a problem for you? I can, I can talk to him. No, I didn't care when you were... Her eyes, her eyes flick over to me and she swallows the rest of her words. When you were, you know, with, you know. I don't care if you like him. I mean, you were with him, so you didn't need to lie. Aideen's eyes flash in understanding. I, uh, you didn't need to lie. You didn't need me to lie and say I was with you. Not for you. You did it for me because you think I did it. Oh, oh, oh shit. Honey, I don't, I... Oh, you think there's a chance I did it? You think I killed Hattie, so you asked me to lie? Because then I'd have an... Uh, so that he will think I can't be guilty? Yan stands up and wipes her eyes with her arm. She leans right into Aideen's face. I didn't! I didn't kill her! Why would I? I was... She just repeats herself as if she thinks we don't believe her. I didn't! I just didn't! I thought you were supposed to trust me! I thought you... I thought if you still wanted me after... After the stealing and the bad stuff, then you must have believed I was good. I thought you believed... I... Her voice is shaking so much that she can't continue. Aideen stands up and wraps Yan in her arms. Honey, I do. I've always believed that, even when you may not believe that yourself. I... I didn't think it was you, promise. I know you wouldn't. I just... I couldn't risk it. I didn't sleep the whole night just thinking about you and about Hattie. She was my best friend. Whoever did that to her, I, I want them to rot. I want them to pay for it. I want them to die. But you were my sister. And I know how it might look, but I know you. If it were you, you must not understand. You couldn't have done that if, if you couldn't have meant it. And I know cops, even if it might not be you, it might not look good. What happens then? You don't deserve to, to have your life changed. That's stupid, I know, and deeply wrong. If that's what truly happened, I will go to hell for it. But you're my kid. If it was you, then I need to bear some of the responsibility too. Then I should already be in hell. Yan shakes her head in Aideen's arms, her voice muffled in Aideen's clothes. I didn't do it. Shh, I know, I know, and I'm sorry, okay? I'm really sorry. I didn't. I know, I believe you. I'm sorry, may I interject here? They both glare at me. One, I do not recommend perjury or tampering with evidence under any circumstances, but the good news is you are both only giving your statement to me, a crackpot PI, not to the police or under oath. Two, if I may ask, Miss Yan, why did you agree to lie to say your sister was with you then? Oh, I thought she did it, of course. What? I mean, you wouldn't tell me about where you were and you wanted me to lie for you. I... She looks like she doesn't know whether to laugh or cry. Instead, she turns to me. For the record, I didn't do it either. All right, all right. Both of you were just lying for nothing. Last question. Can we get off the roof now? They both laugh, but I'm not joking. My knees are going weak from trying not to slip off. Yeah. Yeah. Here you go. A grilled cheese sandwich. Sorry about all of that. It's okay. Now, I imagine you might have some questions for us. Yes. Uh, let's start with Aideen. Oh, of course. Boring. It's okay, we'll talk over there. Alright. So, what haven't we asked her about that might be pertinent yet? Show her this. I really hope there are no more surprises in this photo. Me too. Oh, okay. I just, because it wasn't ticked off, I couldn't remember if we'd done it or not. Okay. Well, could we ask her about someone? I mean, it doesn't look like we've asked her about Hattie. I don't think it's her or Yan, to be honest. I mean, I don't know if that's pertinent now, really.
<laughs> Can't ask about the autopsy report. Uh... Could ask about someone. Ask her about Hattie, maybe. Moses said you were very close with Hattie, is that true? Well, I, I, this is probably a question that was scripted to be a lot earlier in the game. I just thought it was so obvious I didn't do it. Yeah, we were very good friends, as you well know, because we talked about this at length. I'm sorry. What am I supposed to say to that? I'm sorry. People tell me all the time. I never figured out what to say. It's okay, it's not. It happens. Something like this doesn't just happen. Thank you. What for? She lights the cigarette, puts it in her mouth, and takes a long, deep pull. The smoke lingers before her eyes, obscuring half of her expression. I thought about how we might end our friendship. Maybe we'd have a fight. Maybe one of us would leave the circus for good. Maybe we both would. But I never imagined something like this. I didn't even... Didn't even what? Nothing. Nothing important. Just some silly things we planned to do. I guess it's all irrelevant now. It matters. All of it matters to you, if no one else. Why didn't you tell me more about her? What kind of person was she? Smart. Extraordinary. Everyone knew that. You took one look at her and just knew that she was destined for greatness. She was always trying to be better, to be more, even when she was already so much. And that makes you want to do better too. And she was incredibly kind. I know that might not work. Oh, sorry. I know that might not be what you will hear from the others, but I knew her. She had a hard time showing it sometimes, but she always tried to help in her own ways. She took care of her people. And you were one of her people. How did your friendship come about? Well, I guess it started when she asked me to perform with her. She was planning this new trick, this knife-throwing act. She needed someone to perform with her. Do you know why she asked you specifically? I don't know. Maybe she thought I was the only one insane enough to agree. Or maybe she thought I was the only one pretty enough to be tied to the board for the audience to pay attention. It's always the ladies that are tied to the train tracks. Hmm. Uh, let's try again. I haven't asked Yan about anyone else. Um, I don't think we... He'll probably refuse to show her the crime scene photo. We could try. Yeah. Yes, that's fine. Um, show the autopsy report. <laughs> uh, um, I don't think we need to open that wound again. Uh, I don't see a problem with the statements. Who could we ask her about? Maybe no one. Let's go back to the map for now. We've got four four more actions we can do. Spoken to Chip, spoken to those two. I guess we could go and see what Moses and Tito are up to. When I head to the back when I head back to the office, I quickly realise Moses isn't alone. Someone is sitting across from him. Oh, he's getting to drink more milk. It's Tito, the fortune teller. Moses saw me come in and stood up behind the table. Mr. Jones? Have you met Tito yet? Yes, I did. He gave me a reading, too. I glanced at the table. They're almost done apart from some scraps of meatloaf on one plate and cookie crumbs on another. There are also two glasses of milk on the table. Moses finished his, but Tito's is only half empty. Sorry, did I interrupt your dinner? No, we're finished. Moses eyes Tito with an expression I can't quite decipher and cleans off everything on the table besides Tito's glass of milk. All right, how about this? You can do your reading once you finish drinking that. Tito sighs and picks up the glass while turning to me to explain. I was just about to do a reading for Moses. Oh, should I, uh... It's okay. If he says so, I'm okay with you watching. Tito closes his eyes and downs the milk while pulling out a tarot deck from his pocket. Does he carry those everywhere? All right, have your question in mind and split these into three decks, please. All right, I want to ask you about the future of the circus. Moses, with an apologetic look at me, says, I'm humoring him, goes through the motions as instructed. But Tito looks completely serious, the most cold look I've ever seen on a ten-year-old's face. Now, these three cards will represent the past, present, and future. He flips the first card over. Death, endings, mortality, moving forward. I look at Moses. He doesn't seem nervous or apprehensive at all. What have they got? It looks like a corn dog, And fire coming out the death's head eyes. Well, I think we can deduce what that was pointing to. 
Yeah, I bet it's the first time in history that particular card in this deck has ever been used to signal an actual death. Of course, Yan Sabotage has extended this card too, judged by the red evil eyes the Grim Reapers, Reapers sporting. Moses says nothing about the doodles. Guess he's seen this deck before, or Tito and Yan argued about it in front of him. Go ahead and flip over the next card, please. Seven of Swords reversed. Confession, conscience, truth revealed. Does that mean a confession from the killer, or a confession from me? A confession from him. What does he have to confess? It's supposed to represent your present in the circuses. If there's a confession, the thought has already occurred. Have you considered doing such a thing? Moses remains silent. After a while, he reaches for the third card. And this is supposed to represent the future, right? That's right. That's, uh... The Fool, Innocence, Adventure, Beginnings. What's going on around him? It's just... It's like puffs of air or something, or he's whistling, maybe? Something that he's got a little hat on the dog's head. Beginnings, oh, I like that. You know, perhaps it's meant to be. When I started this circus, I chose a gesture as our logo, a fool. He points to the poster on the left side of the tent wall, and then to the pin he has on his suit jacket, both the face of a jester. I didn't think about the tarot card exactly, but I chose it because we should all strive for honesty without taking ourselves too seriously. In the king's court, just as the only ones allowed to mock the monarch. A commoner in a costume can often shed light on truths too hard for the aristocrats and the royal advisers to say. The circus exists to entertain, therefore the jester would he Therefore the jester would be here. What? Uh, I don't understand. Therefore, the jester here reminds us that entertaining can mean different things. It can mean to excite, to educate, to inspire, and I think perhaps to tell the truth when it matters. The past week has been filled with confusion and deception, the antithesis of what this business represents. Sorry, I just, uh, I have some thinking to do. And Mr. Jones, I hope you can help us find the truth as well. I will try my best. Right, sorry about the turn this has taken. Tito, thank you for the reading, as always. You've definitely left me with something to think about. Mr. Jones, would you like to chat? Sure, I have a few questions. What's there left to talk about with Moses? You can ask him about the crime scene, maybe. I'm assuming we've already... Assuming I've already talked to him about it, but... It's not ticked off. Yeah, exactly. So why is it not ticked off? <laughs> um, it's asking about Echo. Echo's a weird guy. So remember the question, assume they are the killer? Echo. Now, this one I don't know about you, but it's hard not hard for me to imagine him committing murder just from his pleasant presence. You said he was the one that discovered Hattie's body, right? That's right. Is there any chance it might have been him? No, I really don't. I know he might have an attitude, but that doesn't necessarily indicate that actions will follow. Uh-huh. Assume he had done it, remember? Well, I guess Echo and Hattie had a history. They dated? No, they're old acquaintances. They apprenticed under the same mentor back in the day before either of them started working in a circus. They ended up choosing to perform different things, obviously. Hattie became a magician and Echo's a puppeteer, but they did study together. I knew their mentor personally. He was a wonderful performer. Everything he knew, he taught to his two apprentices. There's no way he'd see them at odds. So Echo and Hattie were friends, and he didn't have a reason to kill her. Is that what you're getting at? Now, I don't know if you could call them friends, given their differences in personality, but they were amicable all these years. Surely there's no reason for trouble to kick in now. That's just my perspective. I hired you to make your own conclusions. But you asked my opinions, and there you have it. Ho hum, ho hum. Well, he knows about the trick now, so it seems pointless to ask him more about that. I was just asking about this. He, he said he knew the mentor. Oh, exactly. You said you knew Echo and Hattie's mentor. Yeah, Frankie. He was a great magician and the fastest learner I've ever met. When I met him, he was banished from his older circus. How does one get banished from a circus? It's complicated, but it's related to how we treated Echo and Hattie. 
Frankie was a couple of years older than me. He didn't get into this trade until he was in his 30s. Before that, he did all sorts of jobs. Carpenter, fisherman, school janitor. He met his mentor when he was hired for a weekend shift unloading the circus trains. And that's when he first began learning magic. Well, I say learning. He was apprentice in name, but really the magician was teaching his own son and having Frankie do the boring work most of the time. He worked for the father and son for less than a year, lifting equipment and arranging stuff. His men all taught him the basics, but he never trusted Frankie enough with the signature tricks. But he learned them anyway. If what he said is to be believed, he didn't look at anything he wasn't supposed to. He said he just couldn't help his brain from turning and trying to figure out how a trick worked. One day, the father and son found him practicing and kicked him out. He ended up at the circus I was working at and decided he could train himself to be a magician. From what I've seen, I'd believe him. The man made friends with the Spanish workers and was joking and laughing with them in their language in a month. I'm sure if he'd been born into a rich family, he'd be inventing electricity cars or curing diseases. So what happened after he got to your circus? Was he performing the tricks he learned? He didn't want to just copy their tricks, so he started brainstorming, coming up with tons of new tricks and acts. He was a brilliant man. If he didn't know how something worked, he would spend a month puzzling it out in his head and becoming a master at the craft. I believe ventriloquism and puppetry were one of the things he picked up out of nowhere. Of course, someone like him was going to be extremely successful, and he moved on to other circuses, performing as a full-time magician afterward. I see. Because of what happened to him during his apprenticeship, he treated his own students fairly and taught them everything he could. Precisely. I think he saw a lot of himself in Echo and later in Hattie. They both started relatively late and as outsiders. Frankie passed away, but I think he'd be proud of what both of his apprentices achieved. It's an interesting story. Uh, it didn't lead to any new lines of inquiry, however. Two more. <laughs> um, let's quickly go back to the map. I mean, I've, I've spoken to everyone now. It's just a question of what I use my last two slots up on asking. I think I'm going to continue asking Moses about two of the, some of the people in his uh, circus. Um, so we're going to ask him about Aideen and Chip, I think. So remember the question, assume they're the killer. Let's talk about Chip. Why would he have killed Hattie? I need to think about it. Um, I guess, hypothetically, maybe. He's someone who liked attention, but Hattie might have taken it away from him. Ah, jealousy. Classic motive. Go on. But it has been about a year and a half since Hattie joined. Chip seemed fine with Hattie during all of this time. Now, ah, maybe he didn't think Hattie would pose a threat initially, but he was wrong. Or sometimes hatred accumulates in your heart, growing deeper and darker until it bursts forth. But you're right, there's usually a trigger. Something, it might be something big, like a change in their status, or something incredibly small, like an offhand remark. Can you think of any triggers recently? Was Hattie offered a raise or a big opportunity that would have belonged to Chip if she wasn't here? No, can't think of anything. And if Chip just wanted more attention, he's got other options. Like find a job at another circus, in this economy? Moses is getting a little frustrated. He uses the cane to tap the ground a few times for emphasis. I'm just saying, he... He don't need that. Ah, we're getting to his origins here. Well, he may not agree with you, and you know what would be a truly twisted criminal's way of thinking? You know what will get you attention? Killing the greatest magician in a generation. What? Hey, don't look at me like that. I'm not saying that he did it. I'm not even saying he's even considered that possibility. I still can't imagine. Chip's not that type of a guy. I know he may seem a little flamboyant, but if you get to know him, you'll know he isn't an egocentric guy, despite the jokes he likes to make about it. I might not know murder, but I know circus acts. No narcissist can do this type of self-deprecating performance he does, where he invites one and all to insult him. I respect your opinion, but it's a part of my job to assume the worst of people, just as it might be part of yours to find the best. Yeah, I get your point. Alright, nothing. He, did, he didn't give away Chip's parentage there. I don't know how we get to that. Have I asked Chip about himself? No, we did, didn't we? And we didn't. He didn't really say anything illuminating. Uh, all right, let's go on to Aideen. So remember that. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Tell me about Aideen. What was her relationship with Hattie like? They were extremely close. He looks a little stressed and pained, gripping his cane tightly. 
Uh, I really don't know. If I had to name the person who was least likely to have hurt Hattie, I would say Aideen. They were close friends privately and collaborators publicly. Collaborators? Right. Aideen was her partner for the knife-throwing act. Given what the crime scene looked like, don't you think it could point toward her? Let's say the scene of the crime was planned. Then why the knife-throwing? Why tie Hattie to the board? It seems highly symbolic. Is it possible that Hattie injured her, and this is revenge, or maybe she felt forced to be put in this risky situation, and she's giving Hattie a taste of her own medicine? But I don't understand. Aideen was never injured during the performance, as far as I know. Well, it's not a competition, but what Aideen does for her own performances is also quite dangerous. So I don't think that the danger factored in. Well, but some people feel differently about the risks they choose for themselves compared to the risks they aren't in control of. True, she agreed to perform the act. They trained together for months before they came to me about putting the act on the show. Performing it has been a nice bonus for her, but she'd been working as a fire performer for a few years before Hattie even came along, so it's not like she needed the work. I see. End of, end of turn. I don't know if we uncovered very much of use there. Something interesting about the mentor, though, I guess. Still feels like I'm not really getting very close to the truth. And it's time for the big show. Well, it's time for Jackie to go and meet the person who sent her the threatening letter. So that's hopefully going to advance things a little bit. The big show is just starting and the big top becomes the brightest tent in the slowly darkening landscape. I can see the crowd drifting towards it from all avenues like rivers joining the sea. The rest of the landscape becomes quiet and empty. It's the perfect time to have clandestine meetings with the suspected murderer in the train car once belonging to the recently deceased victim. Faint sounds of the crowd and music from the big top begin to fade as I walk toward the train. I can now hear my heart beating in my chest and the blood throwing, flowing through my ears. I can hear the cogs turning in my head. I can hear the bell of destiny ringing. I approach the train. No sign of light. I can't tell if there's anyone or anything inside. This is it. The note said the door will be open. I try the handle and feel no resistance. One hand reaches for the gun on my thigh. I open the door carefully with the other. The room is dark. There's no one inside. What happened to I will be waiting? Is this a trap somehow? What reason could they have? To kill me for my silence? To somehow coerce or bribe me? What even makes the killer think this will work anyway? Speaking of which, I'm not even totally sure this was from the killer. I'm the one you're looking for? Who would write that if not the killer though? What if it's Hattie? <laughs> I can barely see, but I'm not sure I should risk turning on the lights. Too easy to spot for both the writer of the note and anyone who might pass by. I wait for a few minutes, but it looks like the sender is a no-show. What a waste of time. Well, at least I got into Hattie's train car. Maybe this was the sender's goal, that there's something in here they want me to see, hence the elaborate ploy to get me inside. As my eyes start adjusting to the darkness, I begin looking around to see if I can spot anything interesting. I can't read in this light, but there are some newspaper clippings and maps on the wall. On the other side of the room is her bed and a man and a luggage tied down to the train car. Nothing notable. I set my sights on the desk in the cabinet next to me. I can see something glinting on the cabinet. Are these glass trophies? For what? I lean in, squinting to get a closer look. Is that another one that was smashed? Whoa! Magician of the Decade Award for Excellence in Performance from the American Magician Society. Is it me or is it getting even darker in the room? Oh no. Before I even manage to raise my gun or turn my head, the shadow behind me moves, bringing something down with incredible speed and force. The last thing I see is the comical red and gold hammer coming straight at my eyes. Ooh, oh dear. Jackie. And the last thing I hear as my body begins to fall is the sound of glass shattering, the trophy joining me upon the floor. You know... What? <laughs> How... I, uh, but, uh, but... I never heard the door. They must have been hiding in the car this whole time. If only the light and everything went dark. Well, that happened. I need to process this. Hang on. Hang on. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll leave that in for a second. So let me just think about what's just happened. So she goes into the train carriage at the appointed time. And... The 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 the, the trophy. I okay. Hang on. The trophy's not broken, right? Um. Ah, oh, come with this. 
my head's spinning. Um, okay, so the, the trophy wasn't broken, but the attack did break it. However, playing as Jones, we know that the trophy was already broken sometime between the murder and his arrival in the train car. So uh, are they playing in different time periods? I kind of thought they were, they were here at the circus at the same time. But I'm now feeling like they're here on different days. Right? I mean, he's seen Jackie. Or he's seen someone who looks like Jackie anyway. So, you know, she's obviously still there. She, if they are, as long as they're a different, operating on different days, um, then she wasn't killed. It would seem to suggest that he was attacked with the hammer, knocking, knocking him out, by the person who sent the note and just knocked out Jackie. The trophy got smashed, then maybe the, ne maybe the following day? I think, uh, I think we're, this is supposed to be a Friday, wasn't it? That's the, that's the day the circus moves on. So maybe Jackie's on Thursday, or Wednesday even. Ooh, that's interesting. So that's how the trophy got smashed. Um, interesting, interesting. Because I, I, I don't, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, viewers, let me know in the comments, but I don't think there's been any suggestion until now that they weren't here in the game on the same day of the week, yeah? Hmm. Okay. All right. Um, well, we'll go with that for now. Let me just check the time on the video. 40 minutes. I think we'll leave it there. That seems like quite a good place to leave it, doesn't it? Kind of on that uh, cliffhanger. Um, and, and I can sort of digest um, the implications of that, of them of them operating on different days. At least we know what happened to the trophy now. Because I was thinking, did someone come in and repair the trophy? But it seemed like it was smashed to smithereens. But it also kind of solves how it did get smashed to smithereens because you know earlier in the episode i think i speculated that maybe it got knocked over with yan running around on on the roof um but actually taking a big swing at it with a big heavy mallet would have done would have achieved that wouldn't it um but yeah we'll leave it for that there for now i suppose so when we come back it's going to be i presume 7 p.m with jones he says the uh, performance is starting so what happened with jackie i guess maybe she didn't perform on on that day very strange. I'm almost tempted to go back and w watch my previous videos just to see if I kind of get a sense that it wasn't happening at the same time. I mean, it does explain why on Jackie's days that, for instance, Alice is at the stables at 6 p.m. and she talks to her there. And then when it comes to Jones at 6 p.m., Alice isn't there. Because I was like, how can that be the case? How can, how can Alice be in one place for one person but not the other? And them actually operating on different days of the week would totally explain that away, wouldn't it? Um, and it also, because I was thinking as well, when um, when he came in to see Aideen and, uh, and Yan in this episode, they were eating again. I was like, well, they just had a meal with Jackie. <laughs> you know, everyone's already had their dinner. Then he comes in and they're still eating. And I was like, there's a lot of, there's a lot of two meals being eaten by everyone. But actually, it's a different day. It's a different meal. So, uh, yeah, interesting. OK, now I'll have to think about that. Uh, interested to hear your thoughts in the comments on that as well. Uh, any speculation as to potential implications for that in terms of the mystery that we're solving. Um, but, you know, let me know. I'm interested to hear. And, you know, if you enjoyed this one, as I hope you did, if you could hit the thumbs up button, that'd be fantastic. And uh, if you're watching this and haven't already subscribed, subscribe to the channel, uh, would be amazing if you could. So thanks very much. And I hope to see you next time. Bye for now.